In urban parts of our region, there's not a real gun culture, but that's not true the further north you go. A lot of people have a what they consider and is a safe and, and healthy relationship with firearms, and they're not this small slice of the population that so often dominates the conversation about guns. From the New England News Collaborative, this is Next. I'm John Dankosky. This week, we explore the impact of guns in a state where gun rights are precious. And here's an accent that might be familiar. My father sometimes hides his boots by the road in the park. Steve tried to shout calmly, hey, I thought Mary paid for the board and pass it. But researchers say that accent is fading. We'll take a listen. Also, you ever notice how skiing got pretty fancy, pretty expensive? Well, that's not everywhere. We rely on natural snow. That's an issue. That's an issue. This snow is gold to us. And we'll fly through the air at the ski jumps. It's next. Next is powered by the New England News Collaborative, eight public media companies coming together to tell the story of a changing region, with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is Next. I'm John Dankosky. For many people in the state of Vermont, guns are a way of life. Unlike the more populous, more urban states in our region, Vermonters own guns at a higher rate, and they fiercely protect their gun rights. That means looser gun laws than in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, but also a higher rate of gun deaths than in those states. Vermont Public Radio wanted to look into the numbers behind this reality. They found some surprising data and some harrowing personal stories. From 2011 to 2016, 420 people died from gunshot wounds in Vermont, and the overwhelming majority of those were suicides. My guest, Taylor Dobbs, produced the reporting project Gunshots. When we recorded this interview in September, Taylor was a digital reporter at VPR. He's now investigative and statehouse reporter for the Vermont newspaper Seven Days. Matthew Miller also joined us in this conversation. He's a professor of health sciences and epidemiology at Northeastern University and co-director of the Harvard Injury Control Research Center. I started by asking Taylor why the VPR newsroom took on this project. Well, every time gun control was coming up in the state house or gun violence emerged in the news, the rhetoric around guns in Vermont was very often focused on national data or national news trends. And I think a lot of Vermonters know that the relationship that Vermont tends to have with firearms is a little bit different than the nation at large. And so what I was curious about and what caused us to request this data was what does this problem even look like in Vermont? Who's dying and and maybe what could be done to help keep each other safe? Early in this piece, you, you talk about the framing that you have for this conversation, a framing that's quite a bit different in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine than it is perhaps in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. Um, one Vermonter uh, wrote recently that guns aren't scary in rural Vermont. They're just another tool that you learn to respect at a young age, just like the axe or maul you use to cut firewood, the hatchet you use to kill chickens, or the knife you carry to gut trout and feather kindling. Talk about that framing mechanism for this reporting, because it does set up Vermont quite a bit differently than the other New England states that we cover. It felt like there was a piece missing from the conversation. Um, You know, we have these gun deaths. There is gun violence in Vermont and everywhere. But that conversation often misses the other side, the context that this exists in, which is that a lot of people have a what they consider and is a safe and and healthy relationship with firearms. And they're not this small slice of the population that so often dominates the conversation about guns. And so we really wanted to open it up and let those folks speak for themselves about the relationship that they as Vermonters have with firearms, whether that's good or bad or political or apolitical. We just kind of wanted to open up a conversation. And then also the reporting would bring out some of the stories of what happens when things go very wrong. What did you learn about how many Vermonters actually own firearms? This is kind of hard to pin down uh, in large part because there's a lot of resistance to any effort by the government or any centralized entity to tracking firearms. So no one really knows exactly how many guns there are in Vermont. But some studies using survey data and other things have found that it's about 45 percent of households have at least one firearm. The national average is closer to about 35 percent. So that's a substantial difference there. And that kind of shaped the reporting down the road because we started talking about suicide, which was a big part of the story. And um, access to firearms is a piece of that. 
And as we know, there's a relatively large stigma around suicide and mental health. So I think a lot of this is that people are dying, but the public doesn't necessarily know that there was a gun involved or that it was a suicide because of those stigmas. Dr. Miller, before we get specifically into what you study regarding guns and suicide, do you pull anything away from that number, 420 gun deaths in a state where a larger portion of the population owns guns than is the national average? Vermont And for that part, most rural, relatively rural states, if we're confining the conversation to the Northeast, we're talking about Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire, um, all have much higher suicide rates than the more urban states in the Northeast, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, Rhode Island. Um, And it's largely driven by higher rates of firearm suicide uh, because there are many more people per capita who live in homes with guns in rural areas than in urban areas. The, in urban areas, you have much higher crime rates, lethal and non-lethal violence. And so you're going to have a greater contribution to the total number of firearm deaths from homicide in urban areas than you are in rural areas. So having 80 or even 90 percent of all firearm deaths being firearm su- suicides where the other 10% is largely firearm homicides and a few firearm accidents, in rural areas is not, is not really unexpected um, and, and reflects the most likely cause of death from firearms in the home being suicide anywhere you live, but especially in rural areas. So talk more about those connections between firearms and suicides. Is is one of your findings that the easy availability of a gun in any household is something that would lead more readily to suicide in that household? Yeah, the evidence is overwhelming that the presence of a gun in a home, especially if it's stored unsafely, um, increases the risk of suicide dramatically, several fold, especially for um, for everyone in the household, not just the gun owner. So it's a risk that's assumed by the gun owner and unwittingly, I think, imposed on everyone else in the home. But um, the, the likelihood of death goes up two, three, four, five-fold, depending on, on how the firearm is stored. It's especially, uh, uh, it's especially strong risk factor for, for children and young adults, um, even those without any evidence of mental illness. You've advocated for lethal means counseling as a way to reduce suicides in the U.S. What exactly does that mean in in relationship to firearms? It means that you let people who live in homes with guns know the actuarial uh, data and the empirical evidence that having a gun in the home is putting everyone at much higher risk and that if you have somebody who's going through a hard time, whether it's uh, um, mental illness or substance abuse problems or just existential problems like losing a job or having um, a a, a rough time in a relationship, that the single most protective thing you can do for that person is to remove the guns from the home. Uh, It has an immediate effect, and it has a profound effect. Uh, And the data data are overwhelming. If you look within the Northeast uh, at at Taylor's excellent work, and you then had him run another set of articles on homicide rates, um, what, what, what you would see is that the greatest risk that the gun in the home imposes is on the risk of suicide, uh, and that when you look in, in homes with, with guns, the, the likelihood of, of a suicide death among every person in that home just goes up dramatically. Um, in fact, if you look in Vermont, for example, my guess is that the risk of suicide for a teenager living in a home with a gun is as great as the risk of suicide for teenagers who have depression when you think about the entire population in Vermont, because so many people have guns in their home, even if it doesn't increase the risk of suicide more than depression on a one-to-one basis, since half of all homes have guns, in aggregate, it's going to contribute more to the population toll of suicide in Vermont than even um, depression during childhood. So given these statistics, Taylor, 89% of the 420 gun deaths in your state from 2011 to 2016, which certainly lines up with some of the national work that Dr. Miller's done, what is Vermont doing about this? Are, are they 
reacting in any way to try to prevent suicide by firearms? Well, as I mentioned, politically, it's kind of a non-starter in Vermont. There's a very strong and rich history and culture of guns in Vermont. So when that comes up, it's really just it, it doesn't go anywhere. But without any legislation, there's, of course, things that people can and are doing. Um, our reporting, we talked to a woman at the VA who was talking about how removing a gun from the home for a lot of veterans is just not going to happen. They believe that that's one of the rights that they fought for and they should be allowed to have a gun. And so the VA, in in trying to prevent suicides, is is trying to embrace other ways to mitigate that risk. And um, as Dr. Miller mentioned, safe storage is a huge part of that. Um, they always, you know, they say to keep it locked up, essentially put up as many barriers as you can to really rapid access to that gun. Um, another tip, which I, I thought was so striking from the VA, was that they say that veterans should keep a photo of a loved one next to where they keep their gun, um, which when you sort of think of, think about the situation that they're envisioning there, it's a really powerful one where somebody's at that at the end of their rope and, and that photo is what does it. Um, so really just finding ways to slow the process down a little bit so that they don't get to that point of making a decision that can't be taken back. John, can I, can I say something about that? Please do. So uh, Taylor captures nicely sort of the, 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 the way that most people think about veterans and, and their guns. Um, uh, and I completely agree with him that this is not, this is not a problem, firearm suicide, where we're going to legislate our way out of it. But um, I don't accept the, the notion that veterans who want to protect themselves and their family are incapable of removing the guns from their home, at least temporarily, when they or someone they love is going through uh, a, a, a difficult and volatile time. So the, and the VA has been at the vanguard of trying to communicate the, um, and empower veterans to do just that, to remove the gun if they can. And if they absolutely can't, to at least store it safely. Um, but we need to apply the sort of scientific rigor that went into demonstrating that a gun in the home increases the risk dramatically to now understanding how to communicate that risk to veterans and non-veterans in a way that allows them to act in their own enlightened self-interest. What have you found as you study, Dr. Miller, this uh, epidemic of suicides nationwide what have you found about some of the, the things that Taylor laid out, the, the various ways in which you can go about safeguarding a household that has a gun from the possibility of, of suicide or even homicide coming into the picture? So the, the best evidence is really that when you um, look at children and young adults, if their parents store the guns unloaded and locked up in a way that the children don't have access. They don't know the combination to the, to, to the safe. The, the risk of suicide goes down dramatically, but not to the level that it would drop if the gun were removed. Uh, and, and so comparing homes where guns are stored loaded and locked, loaded and unlocked, to homes where guns are stored locked and unloaded, the, the risk of suicide drops maybe five to tenfold. So that's a huge difference. Uh, in, in suicide risk for adolescents and 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 children, um, but w we don't yet have good enough science to know how to communicate that risk. And in that sense, Taylor's spot on that w w we need to apply the sort of scientific rigor that went into demonstrating that a gun in the home increases the risk dramatically. To now understanding how to communicate that risk to veterans and non-veterans in a way that allows them to act in their own enlightened self-interest. And um, those are the sorts of strategies that need to be funded um, so, that, so that people can make decisions based on sort of good information and the concern that they have for themselves or their loved ones. Do you mind if I jump in on that one real quick? Please do, Taylor. Yes, absolutely. One of the things our reporting found in that same vein was that there's a, the state-designated mental health and substance abuse agency has outreach workers who go around the state and, you know, serve as caseworkers. 
And we we found that they actually are driving around the state and carrying cable locks for guns so that when they encounter a family that has a gun in the house and maybe it's not stored safely, they just are giving those away to make it that much easier for safe, safe storage. And that same organization actually offers, f- I believe, free or discounted gun safes. And they say those go out the door as soon as they come in. They have shipments that come in and they go right back out to people on a waiting list for those. So there are measures in place that are working at having that conversation, educating people about the risks and actually doing something about that risk. But, the, you know, the question is, are, are we doing enough? And is there other are there other things that we could be doing to help bring down the risk even more. We've been talking a lot about the risk percentages and communicating that and also talking about data, raw numbers, both in Vermont and around the region and nationally. Taylor, of course, the best way to communicate with people is through individual stories sometimes. What are some of the stories that struck you that you pulled out of all this data you reported? Well, uh, there were a few. I mean, the death certificates, this is all based on death certificates that were released by the Vermont Department of Health. And they have a limited amount of information. It's uh, the circumstances of the death and then some details about the person who died. But some of those told a really powerful uh, story in the little snippets of information they had. I mean, the most striking one uh, that I still think about is there were a pair of death certificates. It was a husband and a wife, um, and he had died by suicide and she by homicide. Um, And on her death certificate, it said that she was married at the time she died. And on his, it said that he was widowed at the time he died. Um, And it ultimately became clear that this was a murder-suicide. But that small amount of detail carried through and told an incredibly wrenching uh, and powerful story. Um, And another thing that happened was after this uh, project came out and we people were going through it, a, a woman wrote in and said that she found her father's suicide in in our data. Um, And she wrote a very profound sort of personal account of what that was like for her and what it was like to have to, you know, deal with the fact that his personal effects that the police had included this gun that he had used for that and uh, and how she went through that and dealt with it. And, you know, it really, really drove home the point that you know, we're talking about data and percentages, and, and it, it turns into numbers a lot. But behind every one of those numbers is a story like that or, or many stories like that. Taylor Dobbs produced the reporting project Gunshots, Vermont Gun Deaths 2011 to 2016, while working as a digital reporter at Vermont Public Radio. He now reports for seven days. We were also joined by Matthew Miller, a professor of health sciences and epidemiology at Northeastern University and co-director of the Harvard Injury Control Research Center. Reporters Annie Russell, Henry Epp, and Liam Elder Connors also contributed to the VPR report. We've got links to all of their reporting and to the Vermont gun death data set that Taylor analyzed on our website, nextnewengland.org. Coming up, how New Englanders talk. It's wicked awesome. And it's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Common Sense Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative and its coverage of climate change and global warming. The Netflix series Orange is the New Black features a woman with a kind of Boston accent. Actually, the character's way of talking is a little more complicated than that, and so is her story. Developing the sound brought actress Yael Stone to Boston. There she met up with WBUR's Sarah Rose Brenner, who brings us this story. I love the beach, but I burn like a lobster, so I'm going to get a good swim shirt. And bonus, it's going to hide the gallbladder score. That's Australian actress Yael Stone as Lorna Morello in season one. She's in prison for stalking a guy she met at the post office. They only had coffee once, but Lorna invented an entire love story between them, and she really believes it. Did she ever make an attempt on your life? Yes. We found a homemade explosive device under Angela's car. Oh, she's being so dramatic. They're twisting this whole story. You might not hear it, but Lorna Morello, the character, is from East Boston. 
Five years ago, early into filming of the first season, Yael Stone, the actress, took a quick trip to Boston to help her learn the character. I think it was two days, yeah. And I had my camera with me and I took some photos, which also I found really helpful. You know, I did I did find those areas imaginatively that I was like, oh, this is maybe what Lorna's childhood house looks like. In addition to photographs, Stone made audio recordings and she used them to start piecing together a biography for her character. You know, two days is not a, not a lot, but it did help me collect a kind of visual audio bank to draw from. My voice and my accent are in that audio bank. On that trip to Boston five years ago, Stone and I met at a cafe, and she brought her recorder. <laughs> and they do, like, each week they choose one character to have, like, a, a backstory on it. Oh, cool. And you find out what, why they're in prison, basically. There's a beautiful part where, which I used to love listening to, where you're talking about, oh, I think you're talking about work and yes, sport. Yeah, it's great, other than the fact that there's no hockey. So. It must have been around Christmas time because there's Christmas music in the background. I think it's, yeah, I, I blame it like solely on Jeremy Jacobs at this point. See, who's the, the Bruins the, the And it just has this like beautiful ethereal quality and, and it's like drifting away and you're talking with your beautiful accent and I, I used to love listening to that. Um, there's a few things I would listen to on the way to work. He's lost the second most games out of anyone. Second Stone listened to that recording and others to help perfect a hybrid Northeast sound. This is not my attempt at a Boston accent. I was also living in Brooklyn at the time, and it is a really Brooklyn sound. There are some parts of that sound, though, that do have Boston elements. So it's definitely a cocktail. And that cocktail reveals a lot about Lorna and her background. The sounds we make tell the story of our life sometimes. So for Lorna, the sounds that she makes tells the story of, of her life. So a life that's kind of moved up and down the, the East Coast, that she's very adaptable. She's done pretty well in prison because she has been flexible. She's managed to create allegiances that have kept her safe. Fisher never came to visit when she had Rosa. You know what she'd do? She'd bring me a heat bar and a cold Dr. Pepper at the end of the day. Isn't that thoughtful? Huh. Maybe you could do that when you come to check on me. Like Lorna, Stone says her own voice tells people a lot about who she is. I don't sound terribly Australian. People tell me that all the time. That tells the story of somebody who has gone to drama school, been made to feel a little ashamed of their Australian accent because, you know, we have a bit of cultural cringe in Australia. Um, so that already, that tells you something about me and my personality. So, you know, I think, you know, an accent can tell a big story. So the next time you're talking to someone or binging Netflix, listen closely. You might just learn something. That's Sarah Rose Brenner from WBUR reporting. All those dropped R's and long A's you just heard are, of course, part of not just the Boston sound, but that of much of New England. But in a 2012 study, our next guest found that the classic New England accent is actually receding. Dartmouth College linguist James Stanford has also used an online crowdsourcing tool to reach over 600 speakers around the region. This big data set allowed them to tease out some subtle differences in the way people from different parts of New England talk. James Stanford, welcome to Next. Thanks. I'm very glad to be here. I want to start by clarifying a bit of the terminology we're going to be using. We, we often talk about the accent that people have, but you use the term dialect. What's the difference? Yeah, we, we often use the term dialect just because it's a little more general. If we say dialect features, then we could be referring to the pronunciation, but it could also be referring to individual words or even grammatical features. So we tend to just kind of generally say dialect features. And then if we're speaking specifically about pronunciation, we might say accent. Uh, we listen to a story about about what we know of as the Boston accent. It's sometimes thought of a, as a stand-in for New England's regional accent. So, so how much of the linguistic history here can be traced back to eastern Massachusetts? This is one of these situations in the U.S. where we can really use linguistics to kind of go back in time because we can trace many of the dialect patterns all the way back to the colonial era. So we had a lot of settlers from southeast England and east Anglia who settled in the Massachusetts Bay Area, you know, starting with 1620. And those settlers, as England started to shift in various different pronunciation styles, the people that were in the eastern side, especially in the Massachusetts Bay Area, 
stayed in close contact with England, Southeast England. And so they kind of followed those features, whereas people that moved farther inland, such as in Western Vermont or Western Connecticut, they didn't get those features. And I think specifically of what we call R-lessness, which is when you drop your R. So like the pak the ka kind of sound. Southeast England shifted toward that pronunciation right around the time of the revolution. And so the settlers who were in the closest touch with the London area picked that up too. You work at Dartmouth College, uh, which is in Hanover, New Hampshire, and you drove across the Connecticut River to Vermont Public Radio Studios in Norwich, Vermont. So as you go across that river, are you going across a kind of a dividing line in the way that people talk in our region? Yeah, to some extent you are, and it's multidimensional because it has to do with age as well. But in some age groups, we found that that Connecticut River, the divide between Vermont and New Hampshire, is a boundary, especially in uh, kind of a senior citizens age groups right now. Back a generation earlier, the dividing line was in the Green Mountains. But what we're finding is that dividing line has moved over. And then for the youngest generation, it's pretty much wiped out. There's some subtle features left. But as far as dropping the R and some of the classic features here in northern New England, we're finding that, say, 20, 30-year-olds often don't have those features. So first of all, why is that dividing line moving, do you think? It seems to be a combination of a number of factors, but primarily it's just more and more contact with regions outside of just the local region. So there's a great amount of uh, immigration into these areas from other states, from the cities. The interstate system came about and more and more contact in that way. But what's interesting is it's not so much the contact between adults that matters, What matters is that you gradually get generations of kids who are starting to hear those features and incorporate them into their dialect. And also they're starting to have more of an outward orientation. We use that term to say, maybe you're out in rural Vermont or rural New Hampshire, but you have an outward orientation, meaning that you're planning to go on and try to get a job in New York City or in Boston. Whereas another person, similar age group, might be planning to continue on the family farm. And that kind of person might be more likely to retain the features. But even so, the younger generations in northern New England are seeing a, de- a rapid decrease. In fact, we, we've drawn graphs where we put the, the age range along the horizontal axis and then put some kind of feature like dropping your R or um, changing the way you pronounce, so like the word father, the, the vowel and the father vowel. We've seen, we can map those out and just see generationally that they're dropping off up here in Northern England. Well, let's listen to some examples. First, let's listen to a speaker from Newton, Massachusetts. My father sometimes hides his boots by the road in the park. Steve tried to shout calmly, hey, I thought Mary paid for the board and passive. Pat laughed and laughed at the merry sound of the shouting. What do you hear in that in that uh, voice? Uh, so we, we did this online study where we asked people to read 12 sentences. And in those sentences we deliberately put in a lot of words that would bring out some of these features, yeah. So one thing is she's dropping the R's in words like boarding. There's also some vowels, like you could see we had the word park in there so that you get the dropped R, but also she says pack. So if you were in in New York City, a traditional R-less New York accent's changing down there too, but a traditional accent in New York would have been pack, whereas up here it's more like pack. It's a, there's a little bit of a shift in the vowel, so she has that as well. And she also has a uh, fronted, we call it a fronted palm vowel, where the word palm or calm is pronounced a little bit more like that, whereas other people might say palm or calm. All right. So, so now, uh, by way of contrast, let's listen to a recording from Middlebury, Vermont. My father sometimes hides his boots by the road in a park. Steve tried to shout calmly, hey, I thought Mary paid for the boarding passes. Pat laughed and laughed at the merry sound of the shouting. Interesting. So so uh, pick apart the differences there. Yeah, so this guy has a, a really nice uh, kind of a rural Vermont sound. Of course, every state that we're talking about is an extremely diverse place with a wide range of people, and the, there's a, a large number of social factors that play a role. So it can be an issue of age and gender and education, social class, and also even your personal identity. But just generally speaking, that type of style of speech uh, is going to reflect some of the some of the features in, in Vermont, some of the diphthongs, so this is like a sound like like time, the I sound, there's a little change, so it's kind of more like time. And you also get that with the out diphthong. So one of the kind of classic uh, stereotypes or just kind of 
things, friendly things that people tease Vermonters about is saying cow like keo. I, I guess I'm wondering if you find that while these traditional accents are fading over time as younger generations take on more of a generic American accent, if there's some holding on to the past, do you feel that, that, that people are trying to hold on to some of these old ways even a little bit? What we're finding is that for some of the most stigmatized, regionalized features, such as dropping your R or the Pak, the Khan, Havad sound, we find that the younger generation tend to be, we call it leveling, dialect leveling, where you, where you remove those features from your speech. But this is only the case in northern New England and in, say, the suburbs of the eastern Massachusetts area. We also spent time down in uh, some of the classic traditional dialect areas of Boston, such as Quincy and South Boston and uh, Dorchester. For people that are in their 20s or old, any age that we ran into in those kind of classic traditional dialect areas of urban Boston, these dialect features are alive and well. But yeah, but in answer to your question, I think that it depends a lot on the identity that the person wants to express. So up here in northern New England, what we're finding is they don't want to uh, be associated with that old style of pronunciation, which, which to them sounds old fashioned, or that it connects them to Boston. In fact, one of my colleagues has a paper called Live Free or Die as a Linguistic <laughs> Principle. And she argues that New Hampshireites want to separate themselves from Boston and the whole Taxachusetts attitude down there. So they are actually intentionally avoiding those features. What we do find, though, is that especially in individual words, some of those words continue on. So one of the famous ones is to use the word wicked in front of an adjective, like wicked cold or, or stereotypically like wicked awesome. That style is more common over here in New England. It's something that people seem to take some pride in. There's also some uh, Rhode Island identity that comes out in the, in the term coffee milk, which is some kind of drink of milk mixed with coffee and sweetened syrup, which people from other parts of the country and even New England aren't aware of. But in our dialect maps, it showed up very strongly in Rhode Island. Actually, let's hear from a, a speaker from Rhode Island here, and maybe we can talk about that specific accent. Sue rode a tan horse to the farm. The horse likes to kick my foot. This old bus can easily carry the bean bags in the laundry bin. I guess that Sherry didn't bother to start my car or lock my bike. See, now what I hear there, but before I, I let you d- dissect that, is, is the word foot which she completely drops the T off of. I live in Connecticut, and I'm used to people dropping the T's completely off of things. This is, we call it a, a T glottalization, where the, the T is actually getting dropped. A lot of us drop it a little bit, but in some of these speakers, it's dropped in a way that's, that's very salient. One thing is that she dropped her R in some of the words that had an R, and that's what we'd expect for Rhode Island because it's on the eastern side. But there's an amazingly sharp boundary between Rhode Island and Massachusetts that's almost literally along the state boundary. And it appeared in our online study, this feature affects words like lot and thought. So if you think of the word C-O-T and the word C-A-U-G-H-T. I'd say caught and caught. You say I'm the same? I, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking I'm saying them the same. I'm not sure that I am. So basically what happens is, is as you cross from Rhode Island into Massachusetts, we find that the people in the north part, so this is going to be all of Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and the northeast part of Massachusetts, those areas most likely they pronounce them the same. So it's just caught and caught. Then in Rhode Island and Connecticut and western Massachusetts, they typically pronounce them differently. So it's like the the bed is like caught and then catching the ball is like caught. But So what's fascinating for linguists is to trace this because here's a case where it's being passed along from generation to generation. And as far as we know, when the original settlers came to New England, they pronounced these vowels differently. And then this is more of a recent thing, possibly in the last 150, 100 years or so in the northern part of England, they got merged together where those two words are pronounced the same. But what's fascinating, though, is that it's following that boundary that traces back to the 1630s of the, the founding of Rhode Island. So even though those vowels wouldn't have been different in the 1630s. The groups of people in the established sociopolitical boundaries are there, and so these things continue on. I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us and sharing some of these voices. James Stanford's Associate Professor of Linguistics at Dartmouth College. Uh, he joined us today from the studios of Vermont Public Radio in Norwich, Vermont. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. 
So are you proud of your accent? A little embarrassed? Or maybe you don't have any accent at all, or at least you don't think you do. Tell us about it on Twitter, at Next New England. Coming up, where in New England can you go skiing for less than the cost of a tank of gas? We'll find out next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the John Merck Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate and clean energy. Here in New England, downhill skiing comes with a high price tag and a ritzy reputation. A weekend lift ticket at Sugarloaf in Maine could run you $95. At Jay Peak in Vermont, well, it's $84. Even at Ski Sundown, a small mountain in Connecticut, it's $62 for the day. But at Veterans Memorial Ski Area in Franklin, New Hampshire, lift tickets, they're just 20 bucks. Instead of a chairlift, there's a rope tow with a T-bar. It's a metal bar that goes behind your thighs. It's attached to a rope that just pulls you right up the hill. About 80 years ago, these no-frills ski areas were more the rule in New England than the exception. So what happened? Well, Sam Evans Brown, host of New Hampshire Public Radio's podcast, Outside In, went to Franklin to figure out how skiing got so fancy. And it took along a couple of ski skeptical co-workers, producers Maureen McMurray and Jimmy Gutierrez. Here's Sam and Maureen. What did you think when you pulled in? What did you, when you got to the place, what did, like, your impression? When we, we pulled up to the place, it was, um, you know, definitely off of a pretty uh, rural road. Pulled in, small parking lot, and there was just this, like... It was a little log. In my mind, I remember it as a log cabin. I don't think it, it was. It was And then I could see that thing that you would describe, the T-bar. I could see that in the distance. In the parking lot, there was um, there were two cars parked side by side. One had a Bernie sticker and one had a Trump sticker. So I felt like it really embodied the, like, you know. New Hampshire. Yeah, like New Hampshire purple. I was like, okay, I can get down with this. And then we walked inside to the lodge. Hi. How are you? I'm well. And your so heart grew fun. three sizes. Uh, it really was. I did feel like the, the Grinch. I just walked in and it was like, <sighs> and then we met Kathy. Oh, Kathy. Can you, can you tell, me, tell me your name on tape? Oh, sure. Kathy Fuller. And how, what's the say on your business card? Kathy Fuller, you know, matriarch of Franklin Memorial. <laughs> I grew up here at Franklin. <laughs> uh, actually, I am still the treasurer of the Franklin Outing Club. I make sure their uh, bills are paid. <laughs> so this is Maureen and Jimmy. Okay. So you They're have the a... novices. This is good. You've got. There's a couple of other kids out there, high school kids. You're gonna yeah. learn. But the snow's great. They're they're going slow, and it's good. Okay. Yeah. It looks amazing. This is like exactly what we wanted. This is exactly what I imagined in my my dreams of what a ski lodge is. I love this. Well, this is this. I mean. It, It was started in 1961 by a group of World War II vets. My dad was one of them, one of the local doctors. It's all the land is owned by the city of Franklin, so they gave us the lease. The Franklin Outing Club has a hundred-year lease for a dollar, and so we operate it. One dollar for the for a hundred-year lease. We rely on natural snow. That's an issue. That's an issue. This snow is gold to us right now. I haven't seen this many people here in a few weeks now. Since we opened up on ice, I, I I think one of the one of the questions that these guys have is sort of like, is skiing a sport that's just for people with money? Absolutely not. Uh, like you'll meet the high school kids out here. Literally, the French teacher bought their twenty dollar ticket for the day. Their ski equipment was free because we gave it out of our donation room. We could find something for you so you don't have to rent the next time. You know? You are selling me on skiing right now. Fun. A day like today, because plenty of pow, as my grandson said, it's all about the pow. The nar pow. Fired up? I'm excited. I am. My, my mood's done a 180, for sure. Oh my gosh, Maureen. A hamburger is less than $3 here. I know. I was looking at Apres Ski, and I'm getting very excited. It's like, okay, and this is an, another question I have is, when did these little ski areas start popping up? 
So I heard about this from a guy named Jeremy Davis. Yep, yep. So I'm um, Jeremy Davis. I'm the founder of the New England and Northeast uh, Lost Ski Areas Project. Uh, and he goes around finding closed down ski areas all over the Northeast and just documenting like, oh, hey, there used to be a little rope toe in this backyard. They were a very common type of ski lift in the 1930s and, and even for several decades thereafter because they were relatively easy to construct. And uh, a lot of people just put them up in their fields. If they were farmers, for instance, during the winter months, they could make some extra money on the side by running a little rope toe um, during the winter months. Um, and a lot of community groups built ski areas. A lot of ski clubs built uh, these rope toes. And they really spread like wildfire all across the uh the Northeast and New England um, in the 1930s and 1940s. And so how many, and when you say spread like wildfire, I mean, how many are we talking about? Yeah, so there would have been hundreds and hundreds of rope toes. So if you look back and cro- across the entire length of history and for ski areas across New England, um, going all the way from the mid-1930s to today, you know, certainly five or 600 rope toes would be a good estimate, if not even more than that. I mean, I, I'm just trying to imagine, if, and those are probably concentrated in certain spots. So if like, if you're in a mountainous area of New England, there's probably one really close to you. Oh, yes. And, that, and that's what's really, uh, you know, incredible about the whole thing is that, um, you know, you look at uh, the the sheer volume of these number of places, and they were pretty much everywhere um, at that time. They were in some towns even had five or six of them, a few, few different places. And it's I think it's really hard for people to to realize how many of these places there were, because right now there's about if you look at all the different types of ski areas that are open in New England today, everything from privately owned rope toes to major resorts, um, including some private ski areas mixed in there as well. There's about 110 um, uh, ski areas that have a lift that are operating in New England right now. So I think that there were six times that number, uh, looking at it, that have uh, essentially closed. It's a really huge number, and I've tried to help kind of wrap my head around, you know, how many places there would be and how amazing it would be if all those places were still open. Jesus, that's incredible. Right? So if... The 30s and the 40s were the golden era of these like inexpensive, accessible mini ski areas. The decline started right after that, and there were a lot of reasons. There was World War II. You had the draft. Um, you had wartime restrictions on gasoline. Um, you had travel restrictions. You had the interstate highway system, which made it easier to travel to get to the bigger and the better mountains. Then you had you know increasing competition, which led to this sort of need to keep up with the Joneses. And if you can't invest in new lifts, new snowmaking and grooming, especially nowadays, it's very tough for some of these places to uh, continue to operate. And rising expenses. The insurance costs can be sometimes more than their entire year's profits. And let's not forget the rise of the American vacation. Travel became cheaper. People could afford to travel to Florida, head to Disney World, take a cruise, whatever. Oh, okay. So that's how skiing got fancy. Yeah. And of course, I mean, the thing that gets us now is that it keeps getting so warm in the winter. That was Sam Evans-Brown, Maureen McMurray, and Jimmy Gutierrez in an excerpt from the NHPR podcast, Outside In. For more, head to outsideinradio.org. Connecticut isn't known for big mountains, but if you travel to the far northwest corner of the state, the Berkshires rise to about 2,400 feet in the tiny town of Salisbury. It's there that you find a little piece of Nordic sporting history. For 92 years, Salisbury has been hosting Jump Fest, a celebration of ski jumping. Picture skiers in brightly colored suits flying off a snow-covered ramp on top of a 220-foot hill. But this isn't just for fun. The competition is a qualifier for the Junior Nationals, and most of the jumpers on the big hill are between 12 and 16, with at least a glimmer of Olympic glory in their minds. Next, producer Andrew Maraskin paid a visit to last year's Jump Fest, and she brought back this audio postcard. Last year in his group, 63 and a half meters, his last jump. Oh, nice oh! 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 He got blue. He got blue. Uh, for the U16s, that jump was solid. How did you feel about your jump? Uh, I think I think I I am capable of doing better. I just have to. Uh, Search for the <laughs> the resolve. I don't know. I think um, it was a solid jump and an improvement, so I'm, I'm happy. Is it 
is it scarier to to jump farther? Is that is that the challenge that you have to get over? I mean, it's it's the safest jump is is the the best technically. Um, so the better your technique, the safer you're going to be. So and the better technique, the farther you're going to be. Your name, first and last name. Willie Hallahan, Salisbury Winter Sports Association, Swasa for short. It started back in 1926. A Norwegian immigrant named John Satry came to the United States. He came to move to Salisbury, and he was a ski jumper, a Nordic skier. He cross-country skied and ski jumped, and he famously jumped off the edge of a barn roof just to show the locals what his sport was all about, and everybody was so enthralled with it that they quickly built a jump, and we've been jumping ever since. And what the people didn't know at the time was that he and his brothers who came after him were some of the very best Nordic skiers in the world. Their coming here and teaching children would have been comparable to, say, Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig moving to Salisbury and teaching the kids how to play baseball. It was that influential. On Jump Fest, I mean, the kids who come here for this weekend come from around the east, Lake Placid, Brattleboro, Hanover, Andover. We like to tell people if they come to Jump Fest, they will see future Olympians. All right, good job. Hey, nice start. I thought I almost fell. You did, but that's because you were up like a big old tree. But you actually had a pretty nice start, Ethan. You jumped hard. That was good. Are you, are you a coach? No. <laughs> no. Just, just giving advice. Are you, are you a ski jumper? I was. Most of us here were, at one point. But my, my name is Larry Stone, and I'm from here originally. But I lived and worked in Lake Placid as a coach for many years. I was the U.S. men's coach and U.S. women's coach for a while. For the Olympic team. Yeah. Wow. What's the science of ski jumping? very simple it's the whole concept of flying and lift over drag and it's turning your body and and skis into a wing and using the aerodynamics that speed give you and 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 your physical force give you to uh to jump up into that position and and ride the air like a wing so i mean how how long is this hill uh this is a 30 meter hill which means it's about 30 meters till it starts to flatten out Whereas the big one over there is uh, about 70 meters before it starts to flatten out. How do you teach kids to get over their fear? Usually it's the opposite. You have to hold them back till they get the skills they need. to. Everybody wants to go up in hill size before they really have the skills. Everybody wants to go big. And, and I'll tell you another thing that's pretty cool is that th- this town has kept this sport alive here since since it started in the 30s here and in the 60s when I grew up and um, it's just an amazing group of people that that decided they loved this sport What goes through your mind right before you go down the slope? Uh, Well, you can only keep a couple things in your mind. Just staying, staying loose and weight on both feet and just to have a good jump. And what goes through your head while you're flying through the air? Yeah, you know, your mind is pretty, pretty clear going through the air um, if you're having a good jump. On the hill! That was Next producer Andrew Moraskin reporting. We've got a slideshow of photos from the 2017 Salisbury Jump Fest on our website, nextnewengland.org. This year's festival runs February 9th through the 11th. If you'd like to find out more, go to jumpfest.org. Next is produced at WNPR by Andrew Moraskin. The executive producer is Katie Talarski. Production help this week from Betty Smith and Taylor Quimby. Our theme music is by composer Todd Merrill. You can hear more of his music at toddmerrill.com. Thanks also to Goodnight Blue Moon for their song, New England. Next is on Twitter. The show is at Next New England, and I'm at John Dankosky. You can follow us and get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. The New England News Collaborative is funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. 
with support from Douglas Stone and Mary Schwab Stone through the Smart Family Foundation of New York and the Melville Charitable Trust. The New England News Collaborative is funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and it's powered by WBUR Boston, Vermont Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public Radio, Rhode Island Public Radio, WSHU Public Radio Group, New England Public Radio, and WNPR.